Each portrayal of everyone's favorite Batman villain has its own feel, but only a few of them feature a backstory. In many adaptations, it's been made explicitly clear that even the Joker himself isn't sure of his own past. Most recently, Jared Leto portrayed the Harlequin of Hate in 2016's apparently Oscar-worthy Suicide Squad. Once again, his backstory remained a mystery. Personally, I'd love to know how they managed to cross Jim Carrey, a large tiger, and Jared Leto. To this handsome hunka hunka. The Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy does a great job of summing up nihilism. Nihilism is the belief that all values are baseless. Unfortunately, the article then goes off the rails and displays some serious bias. It claims that all true nihilists have no loyalties or purpose other than perhaps an impulse to destroy. That, simply put, is not the case. In short, they muddy the waters between what it means to be a nihilist and how some people cope with nihilism. This is a very common problem. Nihilism in the existentialist sense, in the eyes of German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, does not entail any particular response. The nihilist doesn't necessarily believe that life must be meaningless, rather the nihilist rejects that life has any inherent meaning. One possible response to this could be an impulse to create meaning rather than to destroy, and we'll get into that in more detail in a moment. First, however, in order to set the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy straight, let us endeavor to indulge in the tired cliché of quoting the dictionary. The rejection of all religious and moral principles, often in the belief that life is meaningless. Okay, so that seems to fit the Joker. I would say that he strongly rejects all religious and moral principles. The man has no rules. His only goal in most adaptations is simply to prove his point of view to Batman and the rest of Gotham. All Joker Jokers are nihilists at heart because, again, even at his silliest, he still strongly rejects all religious and moral principles. Whether he's a prankster out to take over Gotham City with a flying saucer or a mobster driven mad climbing to the top of the criminal underworld, he's always the nihilist. And I know what you're thinking. By that definition, lots of villains are technically nihilists. Well, yeah, but being a nihilist and allowing your nihilism to drive your every action are not the same thing. Over time, adaptations of the Joker have become more and more nihilistic, thanks to, in large part, to some extremely influential work by Alan Moore. However, even before The Killing Joke, the more silly aspects of the Joker and Batman were mostly due to the Comics Code Authority. It enforced strict guidelines during the Silver Age of comics. DC Comics retconned most of these stories to have taken place on Earth 2, one of the many alternate DC realities. So let's explore the Joker's coping mechanism. Do laughter and complete devotion to chaos help him deal with what he sees as the meaninglessness of life? Did his nihilistic attitude originate from just one bad day? All it takes is one bad day. That's how far the world is from where I am. Just one bad day. John Marmish, author of Laughing at Nothing, Humor as a Response to Nihilism, describes nihilism as a force every human must reckon with, which arises as people contemplate their own mortality, the nature of human existence, and see the futility and lack of meaning in their lives because of life's inevitable outcome, death. In short, you are a speck of carbon, stuck to the side of a rock flying through space, and nothing you do will affect the universe at large. And if you think about it, that's kind of funny. Or as the Joker puts it, You have to keep pretending that life makes sense, that there's some point to all this struggling. Silly goose, it's all a joke. Everything anybody's ever valued or struggled for, it's monstrous. Why can't you see the funny side? Why aren't you laughing? 
People cope with existential questions in a few different ways. Marmish explained that people who dwell on the seeming futility of life can suffer from malaise or a general feeling of discomfort, illness, or uneasiness whose exact cause is difficult to identify. Do order, morality, and knowledge matter if life is truly meaningless? Why not do whatever you want when we're all just going to die anyway? Enter the Joker, whose way of dealing with his own existential crisis was to devote himself to chaos and and laugh at the absurdity of life. It's interesting to note that Batman and the Joker both deal with nihilism, but both react in opposite ways. Although more recent versions of the character get pretty existential, Bruce Wayne becomes Batman because of a personal loss and not nihilism. Still, he's affected by and must react to the Joker's nihilism and his own existential questions. The Joker embraces the concept that life has no meaning and devotes himself to chaos, while Batman becomes a vigilante on the side of justice to create meaning, and also more justice. The juxtaposition of these two characters creates conflict, driving the stories forward in interesting ways. It's good writing. Joker tries to convince Batman to let go of the meaningless conventions set up by society and embrace chaos. Batman tries to convince Joker to adhere to societal norms. Or, as Wisecrack once put it, Batman and the Joker have something in common. Both live their lives as responses to traumatic, worldview-shattering events. Events that represent an existential crisis that most people have to deal with sooner or later. How do you respond when life destroys your sense of meaning? Choosing how to deal with this loss of meaning animates the entire Batman universe. Batman decides to uphold some form of conventional morality. As a vigilante, the Joker chooses to abandon it entirely. And the villain Two-Face splits the difference, literally flipping a coin to decide whether he'll uphold conventional morality or rebel against it. Batman and the Joker arise as supervillain and superhero because of each other, being tied together to various degrees depending on the adaptation. While most people find meaning in their daily lives and the things they do, the Joker feels that their efforts are just meaningless attempts to maintain control, something they never had in the first place. Perhaps you've also heard someone say that the Joker is an absurdist. The first version of this video got a couple of comments to this effect. So let's take a moment to discuss exactly what that means. An absurdist is someone who is intentionally ridiculous, surreal, or bizarre. Mr. J certainly fits that description, a person who holds the belief that we exist in a purposeless and chaotic universe. Well, honestly, that fits the Joker pretty well. So can both of these viewpoints be correct? Let's take this opportunity to further define our terms. I'm taking these directly from the essay The Difference Between Existentialism, Nihilism, and Absurdism, link in the description below. Existentialism is the belief that through a combination of awareness, free will, and personal responsibility, one can construct their own meaning within a world that intrinsically has none of its own. Nihilism is the belief that not only is there no intrinsic meaning in the universe, but that it's pointless to try to construct our own as a substitute. Absurdism is the belief that a search for meaning is inherently in conflict with the actual lack of meaning, but that one should both accept this and simultaneously rebel against it by embracing what life has to offer. To me, being an absurdist can be a reaction to nihilism. So basically, the Joker is an absurdist because he has reacted to his nihilistic views. Now, you may see this in a different way, and that's okay. As writer Daniel Meisler points out, people have written entire books on each of these terms. However, agree or disagree, let's explore the concept of absurdism a little further. In philosophy, the concept of the absurd, as defined by Albert Camus, refers to a conflict between the human tendency to look for inherent value and meaning in the universe and the complete lack of any such meaning or value. Put simply, we want the universe to have meaning, order, and reason, but the universe is chaos universe is random. It's, it's not inevitable. It's simple chaos. It's, it's subatomic particles in endless, aimless collision. That's what science teaches us. But what is this saying? 
To Camus, an absurd hero is a person who can see and fully comprehend the lack of both meaning and inherent value in the universe, accept it, and embrace the freedom that knowledge brings. They make their own meaning and they're happy with that. In short, Camus suggests that acknowledging the truth, the eternity and futility of our fate is enough to render it less crushing. His point was that we can accept and live in a world devoid of meaning or purpose. If you really love me the way you say you do If you love me half as much as I love you King Sisyphus was the wisest of all mere mortals, and due to circumstances that I won't get into here, he was going to die. So he decided to use his own death as a test to see if his wife truly loved him. He ordered her to throw his rotting dead corpse into the town square for everyone to see. In his mind, if she truly loved him, then she'd care more about his dignity than the wishes of a dead man. Well, the joke was on him. She did exactly as she was told while he watched from the underworld. <laughs> so Pluto, Greek lord of the underworld, allowed him to return to Earth and tell his wife off one last time for not reading his mind. Classic love story right there. However, after giving his wife what I assume was the shock of a lifetime, he decided that going back to the underworld would be hella stupid and stayed on Earth for a few more years until the gods had to drag his Greek ass back to the underworld. <laughs> Sisyphus was condemned to roll a boulder up a mountain. It would then roll back down and he'd do it again. Oh, yeah. Brutal and useless labor for all of eternity. To the gods, no other punishment could be so severe. So there are many versions of this story. If you've heard it before in a different way, then well, that's a myth for you. Camus, however, was very interested in the fact that Sisyphus would need to walk back down the mountain before pushing the boulder back up again. If Sisyphus could truly accept his fate and come to terms with the idea that escape was not possible, then he could be happy in the break that he got walking back down the mountain. To Camus, this punishment represents the human condition. We are all Sisyphus, except the Romans. They're Spartacus. I'm Spartacus! I'm Spartacus! You both have the same name? I'm Spartacus. Three of you? I'm Spartacus. This is just statistically unlikely. What's the uh what's the plural for Spartacus? Like Spartaca? We are all condemned to the useless labor of living a life that will be forgotten and cannot matter or make any difference on the scale of the universe. The absurd hero knows this, but lives life to the fullest anyway, taking as much pleasure as possible in the good parts of life. When the boulder rolls back down the hill, they slowly walk down the mountain in the sunshine, savoring the moment, metaphorically speaking. So is the Joker an absurdist? Yes, but as a direct reaction to nihilism. The two are not mutually exclusive. Joker, however, cannot be Camus' absurd hero because he cannot accept the world. Now, Batman is not a nihilist, but he too could be seen as an absurdist, but not the absurd hero. The interesting thing about the Batman is that he comes just so close to being Camus' absurd hero, but falls ever so short. We need to get back on track though, so leave a like if you want me to follow up with a quick tech video on Batman and Camus' absurd hero. Bringing it back around, one of the best parts of the Joker's character is his lack of a consistent origin. In fact, portrayals of the Joker in terms of his backstory are consistently inconsistent. This is true whether we're talking about how Nolan's Joker got those scars or noting the multiple choice background of Moore's Joker. The Joker just is. He just exists. The Joker's original origin story didn't even bother to feature the Joker on the cover. The first attempt at telling the origin of the Joker came in 1951 in Detective Comics number 168. The issue advertised 52 big pages on the cover, and to the right of that, a challenge the reader was literally dared to accept. Can you outguess Batman and Robin and name the man behind the Red Hood? In Alan Moore's acclaimed 1988 graphic novel Batman the Killing Joke, the story is reworked. As a result, the Red Hood becomes a more sympathetic figure. A failed comedian tries his hand at crime to support his pregnant wife. She dies in a freak accident, but it's too late to back out. The comedian, dressed as the Red Hood, turns out to be a patsy. Predictably, he winds up in conflict with the forces of good. You know 
forces of the bat variety. So the red hood falls into a vat and the chemicals inside disfigure him. The chemical bath turns his skin a pale white, it turns his lips red, and his face is forever locked into a gruesomely creepy smile. While many fans believe the Joker's origin to be some version of this story, the Joker makes it clear within that same novel that even he doesn't really know his own backstory. Sometimes I remember it one way, sometimes another. If I'm going to have a past, I prefer it to be multiple choice. Then we have DC Rebirth adding even more ambiguity to the Clown Prince's backstory. One of the biggest mysteries from 2016's DC Universe Rebirth one-shot is the shocking revelation that there are three versions of the Joker in the main DC Universe. As pointed out by my friend and colleague Scott Nicewonder over at NerdSync, we'll likely never know the Joker's true origin in real life either. The story of the Joker's creation is just as consistently inconsistent as his backstory. What we do know is this. The Joker made his debut in 1940's Batman No. 1 and was created by Bill Finger, Bob Kane, and Jerry Robinson. His look was based on the character Gwynplaine from German expressionist filmmaker Paul Linney's 1928 work The Man Who Laughs, crossed with the Joker from a deck of playing cards. However, the exact sequence of events is a matter of great debate. When you ask the three people involved in creating the Joker about the inspiration and timeline of events that led to the character's creation, you get three different stories. That's right, DC Rebirth says that there are three Jokers and his real-world origin has three mismatching accounts. It seems that the Joker's backstory is always multiple choice. For more on the specifics, check out Scott's video over on NerdSync. It's one of my personal favorites. He did a lot of terrific research and goes into a great deal of detail. Bill Finger was going to kill the Joker at the end of the first issue. Finger did not care for reoccurring villains. He thought that once you went up against the Batman, well, that was the end of you. Most early Batman villains wound up dead for one reason or another. They often ended up killing themselves in a ridiculous way. Joker accidentally stabbed himself in a scuffle with the Dark Knight, for example. However, early Golden Age Batman was not above some good old-fashioned guns and murder. His rule against both would follow soon after his creation. Thankfully, DC editor Whitney Ellsworth thought that it was a bad idea to waste such a great villain. He ordered that the last panel be changed to show the Joker was still alive. Since then, the Joker has appeared in tons of comic books, television series, and movies, both cartoon and live action. At this point, I think just about anyone would agree that the Joker is a cultural phenomenon. One thing Batman writers tend to keep the same since The Killing Joke was released is the driving force behind the Joker. I'm talking about the idea that when enough bad events occur to the same person, anyone can lose their love for life and humanity. We are all just one bad day away from becoming the Joker. This version of the Joker has been influential in all of the following portrayals of the character. As a result, he's become increasingly nihilistic. One Joker portrayal that visits the darker reactions to nihilism and the character's devotion to chaos is Heath Ledger's performance in The Dark Knight. In this adaptation, the Joker's commitment to chaos seems its most absolute. The Joker wants to show what people are truly like as compared to how they present themselves. He wants to prove that, deep down, most people are just like him. This, too, is a reaction to nihilism. In The Killing Joke, the plot revolves around the Joker's attempt to turn Commissioner Gordon insane. He plans to give Gordon the same sort of bad day that that gave birth to the Joker. In The Dark Knight, he sets up situations where the people involved must reveal their true nature in order to survive. He gave Harvey Dent a day so bad that he turned into a monster, and despite the fact that neither boat exploded and Batman never broke his no-killing rule, the Joker still managed to prove his point with his ace in the hole, prosecuting attorney and professional white knight Harvey Dent. Commissioner Gordon and Batman only reversed this victory after the Joker's death by instituting what Plato called a noble lie, a myth or or untruth propagated to maintain harmony in society. 
I would argue that it's the darker reactions to nihilism that render a villain scarier than any monster, ghost, or bloody horror story. While the Joker's reaction to the dark side of life is to laugh, there's something unsettling in that laughter. Sometimes things can indeed be so bad that it's downright absurd. The Joker is a sociopath who sees the inherent lack of real meaning in the universe. He is loyal to no one and as unpredictable as chaos itself. It's an unsettling notion. This makes him a formidable foe for Batman. If you dwell upon the more nihilistic versions of the Joker, you'll find that the Joker's complete devotion to creating chaos to reveal the true nature of others is no laughing matter, like Alfred says in The Dark Knight. Because some men aren't looking for anything logical, like money. They can't be bought, bullied, reasoned, or negotiated with. Some men just want to watch the world burn. is nearly as old as the Dark Knight himself. He debuted in Batman number one in the spring of 1940 as a deranged serial killer. This was about a year after Batman's introduction in Detective Comics number 27 around May of 1939. By 1954, the Comics Code Authority had been established, and the Silver Age of Comics had transformed the Joker into a goofy trickster who was out for monetary gain, a lot more likely to rob a bank than to murder anyone. This very well might have been the end of the Joker's murderous personality, but in 1973's Batman number 251, the Joker was once again depicted as a homicidal menace. However, this video isn't about the Joker's history. It's about Batman, the Joker, and a trolley car. So sit back, relax, and let's take a look at philosophy through fiction and maybe break down into an existential crisis. I just, <laughs> I have to be quiet. It, it seems that I may have attracted a supervillain of my own. He's not scary like the Joker, but trust me, he can be scary. What was that? A quick note, my friend Scott from NerdSync did a very similar video to this one and I've tried not to retread too much of the territory he already covered. So if there's something I don't cover, then there's a very good chance that he covered it over on the NerdSync channel. So watch that video, you know, after this one. And the rest of mine, twice. Watch mine twice. You ever seen a short guy dressed in all black, have you? No? The Joker is no stranger to violence and murder. He's taken perhaps thousands of innocent lives. He's also killed quite a few less innocent people. For example, he murdered most of his own henchmen in Batman number 663 in 2007. Among his many victims, we find Jim Gordon's second wife, Sarah Essen, who he killed in front of dozens of infant children that he'd been holding hostage in order to lure her there. He also killed Jason Todd after a particularly brutal beating, but the real truth is that Jason Todd was killed by Democratic vote. Much like Julius Caesar and the Roman Senate, we all killed him a little bit. The Joker also shot and wounded Barbara Gordon, leaving her paralyzed from the waist down. Then he proceeded to torture Jim Gordon with photos of her naked body bleeding on the floor of their family living room. Did you, did you hear something? The Joker seems to be an extreme nihilist. He rejects religious and moral principles and believes that life is meaningless or rather that it has no inherent meaning except for the meaning that we make for ourselves. As he puts it, all it takes is one bad day to reduce the sanest man alive to lunacy. Everything anybody ever valued or struggled for, it's all a monstrous, demented gag. And I've explored all of that in detail, card in the upper right-hand corner. However, today we're talking about utilitarianism and deontology. The point here is that every time the Joker escapes from Arkham Asylum, 
he maims and he kills, and then Batman catches him and locks him back up. The cycle repeats over and over. So why doesn't Batman just kill the Joker and be done with it? Wouldn't the world be a better place? How many countless lives might be saved? And what takes priority? Doing good or just not doing wrong? Is it selfish of Batman to let the Joker live to kill again and again just so that he can sleep at night? Both Jim Gordon and Batman have considered killing the Joker at times, so let's pro-con this whole clown murder deal. If Batman kills the Joker, then he saves the lives of everyone the Joker will ever murder in the future. He also prevents countless injuries and incalculable damage to Gotham City itself. This line of thinking is compatible with the ethical theory of utilitarianism. It states that the best action is always the one that maximizes utility, basically the well-being and happiness of living creatures. So when presented with choices, you should always choose the one that creates the most net gain in well-being and happiness for the largest number of people while minimizing suffering as much as possible. In our example, Batman can kill just one person to save what could be thousands of lives, thereby increasing the well-being of the whole city of Gotham, except for Batman and the Joker, who would have to deal with guilt and sudden death, respectively. Batman, however, won't kill the Joker, nor will he sacrifice the lives or well-being of anyone to even capture him. The Dark Knight justifies his no-killing rule using a slippery slope argument. He believes that if he kills, then he's just as bad as the murderer that he's murderizing, and that once he crosses that line, it becomes easier to consider killing again. In short, he's afraid that if he crosses the line, he may never be able to find his way back again. Batman insists that his morality is tied directly to his own actions rather than the consequences of his actions. Killing the Joker, to him, is wrong no matter the result. This line of thinking is compatible with deontology. This approach focuses on the rightness or wrongness of the actions themselves as opposed to the rightness or wrongness of the consequences of those actions. It's a pretty standard position for superheroes to take. To Batsy, it's irrelevant that killing the Joker might save lives. Murder is wrong, and that's as far as he's concerned. This brings us to the trolley problem, and it goes something like this. You're on a trolley car headed down a track and moving too fast to stop. The trolley will hit and kill five people who are on the tracks. However, you do have a lever that when pulled will divert the trolley car to an alternate track, but there's one person on that track that will be killed. Assuming that you have no other options and all six people involved are innocent, do you pull the lever and kill one person to save five, or do you do nothing and allow five people to die to save one? The lion's share of the research for this video comes from the book Batman and Philosophy. In the first chapter, writer, editor, philosopher, and national treasure Mark D. White asked you to imagine that the person pulling the lever is Batman. Knowing what we know about Bruce Wayne, what option would he choose? Admittedly, Batman is known for finding another way, but if forced to make a choice, what do you think it would do? The trolley problem was first introduced by Felipe Foote, but Judith Jarvis Thompson later elaborated on the idea and she took the middle of the road here. Bruce is not required to pull the lever and save more lives, but if he chooses to do so, then he's justified, maybe even encouraged in that decision. This approach takes both utilitarianism and deontology into account. However, if his view of ethics, or perhaps more importantly his conscience, won't let him take one life to save, five, then that is an acceptable position. The most interesting point here is that the right thing to do and the moral thing to do may not always be the same thing. Most people agree that killing one person to save five is hypothetically the right thing to do in this one particular situation. Still, killing of any kind is an immoral act, just one that maybe could be excused in this situation? Question mark? Thompson also compared the trolley situation to a doctor with five patients, each one dying due to the failure of a different transplantable organ. White reimagined this hypothetical doctor as Dr. Hush to work it into his Batman motif. I'll do the same, however, 
I just finished reading Injustice, Gods Among Us, so I know that at least in one alternate reality, the Joker knows his way around an operating room, so we'll use him. Would it be okay for Dr. J to drug his nurse, who is, of course, Harley Quinn, and transplant her organs into his patients? He would be saving five lives at the cost of just one. We all know that it's immoral, but is it the right thing to do? Most people would say no, even though the circumstances are similar to the trolley thought experiment. To add my very own twist, here's something the Joker might actually do. What if he opened up all five patients and removed the offending organs, then opened up Harley Quinn and took out her organs too? That's right, the Joker and Harley Quinn are not hashtag relationship goals. The Joker is an abuser and Quinn is his victim. Hashtag say no to clown love. So now we have a choice, right? We can have our ethical replacement doctor put the organs back in Miss Quinn, but she may die after having five organs removed. On the other hand, the five innocent patients that need the organs could have a better chance of living. Do we save five people's lives at the cost of one who would probably die anyway, or do we return the organs to their rightful owners and hope for the best? Furthermore, what if we stop assuming that these people are morally equal? What if the five people were serial killers while the one person was a normal, everyday, nice person? Uh, we'll call him the off the top of my head, totally made up name, Scott Nice Wonder. These classic trolley style problems are presented to us through stories about the Joker all the time. He wants us to know that our morals, values, and beliefs are totally baseless. He wants to show what people are truly like compared to how they present themselves, and he wants to prove that, deep down, most people are just like him. All it takes is one bad day. But most of all, he wants to watch the world burn. Okay, you can have your Xbox back, jeez. Thanks, Dad. Deadpool, the merc with a mouth, the regenerating degenerate. What can Marvel's rated R superstar and his complete disregard for the fourth wall teach us about philosophy? Is Deadpool the greatest philosopher ever? Is that the dumbest question ever? Let's find out. Hey you fancy nerds, I'm Jay and this is a quick take. This video is based on the first chapter of the book Deadpool and Philosophy, My Common Sense is Tingling by Dr. Grant. Isn't that a great title? To quote the book's opening directly, the fact is Deadpool brings us a literally obscene number of philosophical questions. Now there are many videos out there covering a wide array of these questions. This one from Wisecrack is my favorite, but it's not like they need my help to get views. But today we're going to concentrate on one very specific idea. Is Deadpool a philosopher? Minor movie spoilers ahead, and so with that in mind, it's time for maximum effort. In short, Deadpool knows that he's fictional. In the very least, he's taken a very intuitive wild guess. What this means is that Deadpool can examine his existence from the outside in a way that you and I will simply never be able to do. Sure, you and I can attempt to step back and examine our lives from the outside, and that's what good philosophers do. However, unlike Deadpool, we have trouble visualizing our place in the universe from the outside without feeling disassociated or disconnected from the events of our lives. This can feel like a mild but creepy deja vu or even seem like a mental illness. Think about a stranger talking to himself in the third person, for example. The fact of the matter is that this sort of temporary disconnection from our own reality is often the best tool that philosophers and even sociologists have to try and learn about the world and our place in it. You can't make objective observations about yourself or your world until you at least try to imagine that you have an objective viewpoint, even while knowing that an objective viewpoint is something you will never truly have. This is why being able to break the fourth wall makes Deadpool potentially such a great philosopher. To clarify, let's take a look at one quick example. 
In the 2016 Deadpool movie, as Colossus drags Deadpool off to see Professor X, our deformed avocado of an anti-hero has a question. McAvoy or Stewart? This line is a great example of what we're talking about here. When Colossus or Negasonic Teenage Warhead go to see Professor X, they see a wise, powerful mutant leader who coincidentally went from being a dead ringer for James McAvoy to being a dead ringer for Sir Patrick Stewart as he got older if those actors even exist in that universe at all. My point is that Deadpool is using resources from outside his fictional universe. He knows that Professor X has been portrayed by two actors. He knows that there are multiple timelines within Fox's cinematic X-Men universe, and that sort of information comes as a direct result of his ability to break the fourth wall. He put his own universe into context in a way that is simply unimaginable to the rest of the inhabitants of that universe. For the most part, philosophers do the same thing. Some of them even go so far as to suppose that our world is fictional, or a computer simulation, or an idea in the mind of God herself. To quote Dr. Grant directly, they, philosophers, want to look at the world from the outside, or failing that, they want to look at their own lives from the outside. Wouldn't knowing the exact source of your own universe and importing information from that source be uniquely helpful in that endeavor? Classical Greek philosopher Socrates once said something to the effect of, an unexamined life is not worth living. When Deadpool breaks the fourth wall, he's able to ask questions about his own life, many that few people in his own universe can ask. He's also able to examine his own life in a way that is simply not available to philosophers in this universe. Furthermore, he's able to break the fourth wall within his own fourth wall break. In that instance, he's not just examining his universe from the outside by stepping into ours, he's also examining his own life, and seeing that stepping outside of his life is a characteristic of his life. Put simply, he can only break the fourth wall during a fourth wall break by being aware that breaking the fourth wall is a habit of his. Frankly, it's an astonishing level of self-awareness, both within the fictional universe and within our real universe. Well, our probably real universe. By practicing the same act of stepping back and attempting to look at our lives objectively from the outside, we too can live an examined life. And that level of self-awareness would be helpful and valuable to any of us. All things considered, Deadpool and Philosophy is a weird but wonderful book. It's totally unlicensed, and yet it contains interjections from Deadpool himself. The whole thing is crass, rude, and deep and thoughtful. It's a paradox, much like Deadpool, and I love it. We only covered the first few pages, so if you're interested, there's a link in the description below. Full disclosure, it's an affiliate link. Batman, as we've discussed many times before, is a superhero from DC Comics. Artist Bob Kane and writer Bill Finger created The Dark Knight, who debuted in Detective Comics number 27 in 1939. The Caped Crusader is, in reality, Bruce Wayne, Gotham City billionaire, philanthropist, and all-around handsome Randian hero. After witnessing the tragic killing of his parents, Dr. Thomas Wayne and Martha, Batman trains himself, both physically and mentally, and then makes the totally logical decision to dole out street justice and fight petty crime while dressed as a bat. You know, like you do. Robin, on the other hand, could refer to multiple characters within the continuity of DC Comics proper. Bob Kane, Bill Finger, and this time Jerry Robinson created the original Robin, who made his first appearance in Detective Comics number 38 in 1940. The Boy Wonder's backstory shared a lot in common with Batsy. Dick Grayson, an eight-year-old acrobat, loses his family when they're murdered by a mobster that had been extorting money from the circus where they worked. John and Mary Grayson of the Flying Graysons were unaware that their trapeze equipment had been sabotaged and as a result they fell to their deaths. After Batman investigated the murder with the help of young Dick Grayson, he used his public identity as Bruce Wayne to gain custody of the young kid. Together, 
Batman and Robin, often called the Dynamic Duo or the Caped Crusaders, make a formidable team. But is it ethical? Specifically, is it ethical for Batman to train an orphan child to put his life on the line every night to fight crime in a colorful costume? Today, we're turning to Batman and philosophy, the dark night of the soul for some answers. Those answers are found in chapter two, written by James Dia Giovanni, which I'm sure that I did not pronounce correctly, but I'm just going to run with it. Side note, you'll find an affiliate link down below where you can get your own copy of this book and help the channel out just a bit while doing so. And also a shout out to co-editor and chapter one author Mark D. White, who is a friend of the show. And by friend, I mean he puts up with me on Twitter, which is no easy task, just ask Scott. So Batman and Robin and ethics. Is it ethical for Batman to train young boys to be Robin and send them out to fight dangerous criminals? To answer that, we need to understand ethics, the branch of knowledge that deals with moral principles. In the book, Dia Giovanni asked us to suppose that we found an orphan child on the streets. What are the morally acceptable actions that you could take in that situation. You could turn the child over to social services. You could take the child into your home and raise them as your own. But not many people would think that training the child in martial arts and sending him out to fight would be a morally acceptable answer. Yet historically, D. Giovanni points out, ancient Spartans, medieval royalty, and New Guinean warriors all exposed young boys to potentially lethal danger in the name of helping them grow into young adults. Medieval royalty even dressed the young boys up in capes and symbols and frankly that's very Batman-like behavior. But just because people have done things historically, that doesn't mean that those actions are ethical. I hear you yelling at your phone while you drink your monster energy drink and briefly consider watching a different video. That's right. I can see you, Steve. That is correct, however. An action isn't automatically ethical just because it's traditional. So, how do we judge what is and what is not ethical? Well, ethics, D. Giovanni says, could be defined as the attempt to live by a set of duties where it's necessary to follow some of these rules or act on some of these duties regardless of the consequences, simply because the duty itself is most important. This is called deontological ethics, from the Greek word deon, meaning duty. Regular viewers of the show will recognize the concept of deontology from previous videos like this one about Spider-Man. In the eyes of German philosopher Immanuel Kant, the most important duties must be universal and categorical, meaning without exception. In other words, you can't pick and choose. For example, if you believe there's an important ethical duty not to tell lies, as many people do, then you can't cherry pick certain times when lying is okay. If never telling a lie is an important ethical duty, then there are no exceptions. D. Giovanni asked us to imagine that Batman has been captured by the Joker. If the Joker asked where Robin is, then Batman can refuse to answer or dodge the question but he cannot lie about Robin's location, even if it leads the Joker into a trap and therefore saves time, money, and lives. If the duty to not lie is universal, then it applies to everyone, including the Batman. And if it's categorical, then it applies to all situations all the time, including this one. To quote Kant directly, act only in accordance with that maxim through which you can at the same time will that it become a universal law. And what Kant is saying here is that to find out if a given act is ethical, we must ask ourselves, what if everyone always acted this way all the time? In our example, we ask, what if everyone lied? To put it mildly, that would be bad. And so lying must be bad, regardless of whether or not the consequences are good and bad. 
Kant argues that if your maxim doesn't universalize in this way, then it cannot be ethical. So, is training a young robin ethical? Well, what if everyone trained a young boy to fight crime in a costume? It sounds like chaos in a dangerous situation for everyone. Therefore, under deontological ethics, Batman has acted unethically in training Robin. But that stupid J, you say, as you get your damn Cheetos dust all over the place. Well, hang on, Steve, I'm not done. D. Giovanni is quick to point out that maxims are rarely this specific. If Batman himself were to attempt this same exercise, then he might come up with do anything you can to help orphans. And that sounds a lot more reasonable and much more universal. But what about do anything you can to help orphans while protecting their personal safety? That seems even more reasonable and universal. And if you've ever heard of Jason Todd, then you know that Batman doesn't always succeed in the safety department. I think there's a good case to conclude that, according to deontological ethics, training Robin is in fact unethical. However, it's far, far from the only way to look at the situation. Take a moment to do the ethical thing and click that like button, and then we'll move on to consequentialist ethics. Up until this point, we've been considering the ethics of an action without regard to its consequences. But in consequentialist ethics, it's considered to be the most important part. Consequentialism holds that the consequences of one's conduct are the ultimate basis for any judgment about the rightness or the wrongness of that conduct. Utilitarians like Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mills would argue that an action is good if its consequences are good. So what is utilitarianism? No one who's ever watched my content ever asked because I talk about it way too much. Well, utilitarianism states that the best action is the one that maximizes utility, basically the well-being of sentient entities. Jerry Bentham described utility as the sum of all pleasure that results from an action minus the suffering of anyone involved in the action. So do the consequences of training Robin and sending him out to fight crime result in more good than it does harm? This is more complicated than it sounds because we have to consider every variable. How does it affect Robin physically and mentally? How does it affect the people of Gotham, or the crime rate, or the cost of repairs? And the list goes on and on. This could be debated indefinitely from either side, but if you're one of those people that believes that the very existence of Batman and Robin leads to the existence of the Joker and the rest of Batman's rogues galleries, well, you're very likely to believe that not only is training Robin unethical, but being Batman is also unethical. Now, our question from last time seemed simple. Is it ethical for Batman to train Robin? To try and answer that, we discussed ethics, the branch of knowledge that deals with moral principles. And specifically, we covered deontological ethics, the idea that ethics should be based on duty and obligation, and consequentialist ethics, the idea that ethics should be based on the consequences of one's actions. So, what's left to cover? Well, wait a minute, Steve, and I'll tell you. Enter virtue ethics. The Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy defines virtue ethics as a broad term for theories that emphasize the role of character and virtue in moral philosophy rather than either doing one's duty or acting in order to bring about good consequences. In other words, take the action that you think a virtuous person would take in your particular situation. Going back to the book that inspired these videos, Batman and Philosophy, Chapter 2 author James Giovanni discusses Plato. Born in 428 BCE, Plato was the first Western philosopher to write in the tradition of virtue ethics. Now, Plato did believe that some universal rules apply to everyone. However, in his mind, different ethical norms apply to different people depending on their role in society. So let's say that you saw a spoiled rich kid shoplifting out of boredom 
and a hungry poor kid stealing food to eat. And most people would agree that the spoiled rich kid has acted unethically, but what about the poor starving child? According to deontological ethics, the act of stealing is wrong in and of itself. Consequentialists would require this kid to stop and consider how his action might affect others, like the store owner. Virtue ethics, however, is a different batarang altogether. According to virtue ethics, what's wrong for one person may be okay for another, and we use this type of ethical reasoning all the time. It's the reason why a police officer can handcuff and detain a person while a normal citizen cannot. It's the reason why a soldier can shoot another person while at war, but old man Jay here can't shoot the kids that play on his lawn. Some rules still apply to everyone equally, but others are based on a person's role in society. For example, your current role in society is to share this video on Facebook or Twitter and then click the like button. Go ahead. I'll wait a second so you can pause the video. Alright, some of you guys actually brought up the concept of virtue ethics in your comments from the previous video. For example, NerdZone said, Steve is the worst. That's, that's not the right comment. It is true though, Steve is the worst. But I was referring to this thread where I talked with WillSherm28 and GuntherTime on Reddit. WillSherm28 says that he could see why Batman would train Dick Grayson, but not Jason Todd, because Grayson's childhood was very similar to Batman's childhood. And if Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson were orphaned by criminals at a young age, then training to fight crime may be the most virtuous choice for them, but that's not necessarily true for the other people who took up the mantle of Robin. Gunter Time, meanwhile, makes the point that Jason was much older and already had bad habits when Batman started training him. And going back to our source material, Dia Giovanni also points out that Jason Todd's character had already been shaped by his life of crime. As he puts it, quote, Perhaps Jason was simply unfit for the role of superhero, lacking the natural propensity or inclination, end quote. Jason Todd and Bruce Wayne both discovered the hard way that sometimes even the best of intentions are incapable of producing a morally good outcome, and virtue ethics admits to this. 20th century philosophers like Michael Slott and Martha Nossbaum and this person, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that, all argued that there were problems with deontological and consequentialist ethics that were fixed in virtue ethics. If the previous two ethical positions that we've covered are both all about taking the right action, either by evaluating the action itself or its consequences, then how does one go about making right decisions? Both deontological and consequentialist ethics seem to assume that we already know right from wrong, but do we? We all learn what's right and wrong through training. As children were rewarded for acting correctly and punished for acting badly, at least ideally anyway. Without that training, no amount of abstract knowledge of good behavior or ethical theorizing will help us to be good ethical people. Now, in working this very information-dense book chapter into a short two-part video, I've certainly simplified things, and I encourage you to buy the original book. If not, to better understand the chapter on training Robin and ethics, then to read the other 19 super interesting chapters, many of which will be future video subjects. So, you know, click the subscribe button. Full disclosure, the Amazon link I've supplied for the book is an affiliate link, and if you click through and buy this book or anything else, then the channel will earn a small percentage, but that won't change the price that you pay. But anyway, to sum things up, is it ethical for Batman to train Robin? Well, I'll let D. Giovanni handle this one. Quote, No matter how you may answer based upon your particular ethical perspective, what seems clear is in the context of this issue, Batman is a lousy deontologist, a decent consequentialist, and, most assuredly, 
some kind of virtue ethicist. And without being the world's greatest detectives or philosophers, we'll have to leave it at that. With Spider-Man mostly back at home in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, we wanted to ask ourselves, what is it about Spider-Man that makes him such an intriguing and relatable superhero in comic book lore? He's the superhero we most often set apart from the Superman that we see, and instead of being a billionaire playboy who embodies our greatest ideas, Peter Parker is one of us, a working class kid trying to balance his everyday normal life with his extracurricular activities as your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. His life and his morals aren't already defined by the time he becomes a superhero. He has to learn on the job just like the rest of us. Because he's so flawed and relatable, Spider-Man gives us a great opportunity to talk about the philosophical concepts of utilitarianism and deontology and how they fit into Spidey's ethical framework. Now we all know the phrase, with great power comes great responsibility, so much so that they had to find a way to say it without saying it when they introduced Tom Holland's version of Peter Parker in Captain America Civil War. Because I've been me my whole life and I've had these powers for six months, mm -hmm. I read books, I build computers. And, and yeah, I would love to play football, but I, I couldn't then, so I shouldn't now. Sure, because you're different. Exactly. But I can't tell anybody that, so I'm not. Look, when you can do the things that I can, but you don't, and then the bad things happen, they happen because of you. Still, it's an essential part of his character, especially because Peter is just a confused kid trying to figure out who he is in the wake of his body going through one of the most blatant puberty metaphors in all of comics. It's also one of the most interesting questions for a superhero to ask themselves. What do I do now that I have superpowers? Do I become a superhero? Can't I just be a regular person? But balancing his lives as Peter Parker and Spider-Man and the challenges that come with that is what makes Spider-Man unique as a character. He's the rare superhero, the one to actually ask himself that question. Are you going to finish the video or are you just going to play Spider-Man? The ethical issue of whether or not you have a moral imperative to use whatever power you have to help others is rooted in utilitarianism, the moral theory developed by Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill in the 1800s. While there are several schools of utilitarianism, the basic premise is that there is no intrinsic right or wrong when it comes to specific actions. Instead, you determine whether something is right or wrong based on the consequences of that action and how that affects people around you. Ideally, someone acting ethically based on utilitarianism would take the action that brings happiness to the largest number of people. But it's the consequences of the action, not the motivations behind it, that determine morality. On the other side of the coin from utilitarianism is deontology, which says that the motives of the person taking an action are more important than its consequences. Deontology is most commonly associated with the teachings of philosopher Immanuel Kant, who said that moral rightness comes from one's own sense of duty, or deal. When someone does something, says Kant, it must be done from a place of intrinsic good, or good without qualification. This is the core of what Kant calls the categorical imperative. You must treat doing good as an end, not a means, and always keep in mind that you are part of a community that you must engage with and protect. So what's the difference between these two schools of thought? Let's go back to Spider-Man and the death of Uncle Ben. Everyone knows the story. Peter gets his powers, decides to use them for personal gain, lets a criminal pass because he doesn't think it's his job to fight crime, and finds Uncle Ben gunned down by that same criminal. Peter's original decision to use his powers for personal gain is a very selfish one, but could be justifiable from the point of view of utilitarianism. 
He doesn't act out of a sense of duty, but for the individual good that would result from capitalizing on his gifts. From Peter's point of view, he's maximizing utility. He'll be happier with the money he earns with his powers. Mary Jane will be happier with him. Aunt May and Uncle Ben won't have to work anymore, and so on and so forth. Stopping the criminal could put all of that at risk. And for what? The good of one man? The man being robbed? Peter doesn't even much like him. In utilitarianism, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Sorry, wrong franchise. Um, it's only after Peter sees that the criminal has killed Uncle Ben and realizes that he squandered an opportunity to stop him that he finally understands that his actions were immoral. From then on, Spider-Man heeds the words of his late uncle. With great power come great responsibility, and he adapts a more deontological system of ethics. In becoming a superhero, Peter acts out of a sense of duty to his community. Fighting crime as Spider-Man is its own intrinsic good, regardless of the consequences. He doesn't directly, personally benefit from being Spidey, except for the fringe benefits of feeling useful and doing good in the community. Any occasional small payment for photos of Spider-Man, but that doesn't even come close to covering his rent. All too often, the burden of being a superhero weighs on Peter, straining his personal relationships, as well as his school and work lives. In the movie Spider-Man 2, he gets fed up with it all together and quits to selfishly focus on his life as Peter Parker before remembering his duty by the end of the film and donning the spandex once again. <laughs> I, I said duty. Hey, stop that. D don't do that. Oh, God. This can't be justified by any philosophical idea. Now, I'm not saying all this is cut and dry. Even as he acts mostly out of great responsibility, Peter looks at situations with a very utilitarian eye. Think about the climax of the first Spider-Man movie, where Spidey has to choose between saving Mary Jane or a tram car full of children as the Green Goblin drops both. A utilitarian would choose the outcome that led to the greatest good for the most people. Luckily, Spidey is able to save the kids and Mary Jane, the most utilitarian choice of all. Killing his nemesis can also be justified by utilitarianism. While deontology says that murder is intrinsically immoral, Spider-Man looks at the moral good of the consequences of killing villains. The greater community is saved. Technically, in the Tobey Maguire series, the, the idiot kills himself, but we can, we can overlook that for the sake of a good point. Uh, this is the power and the risk that rigid adherence to a philosophy can bring. Utilitarianism and deontology can both be used to justify or condemn just about anything. Spider-Man, however, is careful to avoid such easy answers. We can make a great case that Spidey lives by deontology or utilitarianism by cherry-picking our examples, and we love to do just exactly that for the sake of explaining what these concepts are. In the end, though, uh, Peter Parker is something we can all relate to. A uh, person in over his head, doing the best that he can. So just one more quick thank you to our wonderful patrons on Patreon. You can support the channel at patreon.com slash fancygeeks and get a video made on a comic or character of your choice. If you can't afford Patreon, then you can still be a huge help by sharing this video on Twitter, Facebook, or Reddit. And you can come chat with me directly on Discord, link in the description below. Thank you for making it to the end of the video. And until next time, guys, be kind to each other. I'm Jay Parks.